The third full-length book that I devoted to Orwell, titled Every Intellectual's Big Brother, George Orwell's Literary Sibling, appeared in 2007. And Every Intellectual's Big Brother is meant, of course, to be a fond tribute, homage to Orwell, so to speak, with a special emphasis on the fact that Orwell is not an oppressive, tyrannical Big Brother, BD, capital B. As Winston Smith puts it in his diary in 1984, but rather a benevolent big brother, small b -B. And so I deliberately lower case that phrase in order to emphasize that I'm talking about the way in which so many intellectuals of generations preceding mine, in whose tradition I would like to have a place, have found Orwell to be an enlivening, supportive presence. Not the anxiety of influence, but the inspiration of the heroic. Every intellectual big brother. As I said, this is the third full-length study that I've devoted to Orwell and his life, work, and legacy. I edited a book that was a collection of the proceedings from the Centennial Conference that I co-organized in 2003 in Boston, Massachusetts. The title of that was George Orwell into the 21st century. But that was an edited work in which I contributed a couple of essays. This full-length work, Every Intellectual's Big Brother, returns to uh, a key interest of mine in my first book, The Politics of the Reputation. That is, how intellectuals and writers have responded to Orwell and how they have contributed to his reputation, even as he has exerted an imprint, stamped his imprint, on their emotional and intellectual lives. And so every intellectual's big brother consists of reception scenes, as do the other books, but ones that are centered on the journals and magazines that form the hub of different intellectual groups in the very communities. I first developed the concept of seeing how reputations radiate into wider public spheres via intellectual communities, which serve as a kind of intermediary between the leading critics and reviewers and the wider organs of mass circulation publications and the mass media. So that one way of fully sketching a reception scene is to see the full scene within which a writer's work is being received. That means not just reading a review or an essay by a writer, but finding out what publication this is for, what's its politics and cultural stance, who are the other members of the group that is central to its existence? 
the editors, the audience of this publication. And so, both in the politics of their reputation and then more extensively in every intellectual big brother, I speak of the partisan review writers, the dissent writers, the writers around the journal Modern Age, cultural conservatives, the writers affiliated with The Nation magazine in the 1940s, Diana Trilling, their staff book reviewer by the 1980s and 90s, Christopher Hitchens, the columnist who celebrates Orwell, and so on. Each of the chapters in Every Intellectual's Big Brother concentrates upon a particular publication and one or two leading figures associated with a certain school or movement that took up Orwell as their guiding spirit. For instance, the movement writers of the 1950s, in particular John Wayne and Kingsley Amos. Or, as I mentioned, the nation writers. Not just Diana Trilling, but others, sometimes much more critical of Orwell, approaching him from a pro-communist or even Stalinist critique, like Isaac Rosenfeld writing in the nation, to advocates, admirers, such as Christopher Hitchens, who not only writes extensively uh, in the nation at that time, but even publishes a book in 2002, Why Orwell Matters. All of these reception scenes were meant to show the role of Orwell's intellectual progeny, his younger literary siblings in the formation of his reputation and in the development of their own intellectual lives. One of my theses in this book and in earlier books is that many writers and intellectuals have strongly responded to Orwell as a way in and through him of finding their own voice and vision. This is what I describe first in the politics of their reputation and thereafter as transference heroics. The way in which an author will often elevate another author and treat him as a kind of ego ideal, as a vehicle for growing into one's own unique best self. That is the inspiration of the heroic. And with a benevolent big brother, it's quite possible for it to occur, rather than the anxiety of influence that a tyrannical capital big brother will often represent. So, of course, my title is also a slight exaggeration. Orwell is not every intellectual's big brother. In fact, certainly Marxist, some psychoanalytic, other critics and intellectuals have been hostile and castigated his work, ranging from the early post-war era, A.L. Morton, to more recent times, it is critics such as Edward Said, or Raymond Williams, or E.P. Thompson, have not universally admired the but he is every intellectual's big brother to a surprising extent, insofar as numerous intellectuals across the ideological spectrum, from the right to the left, 
Conservatives and neoconservatives like John Wayne and Kingsley Amos and Irving Kristol and Norman Potteritz to those on the left, such as Morris Dickstein, Irving Howe, Lionel Trilling, and others have adopted him as their benevolent big brother. It's that distinctive fact, Orwell is probably the only contemporary writer who has commanded this kind of admiration, not from one particular segment on the political spectrum, but across a broad continuum that marks his uniqueness. That is one reason that he has had no successor. No many candidates have been proposed. Other intellectuals have been admired, but the esteem has been limited to only part of the intellectual spectrum. One example would be Irving Howe on the liberal left, or Irving Kristol or Russell Kirk on the neoconservative or the cultural conservative right, but not the kind of broad spectral admiration that Orwell has commanded. It's in that respect that I intend the title to function. Every intellectual's big brother, that is, regardless, in some ways, apart from ideological commitment. And Orwell is somebody who is admired not simply for his political acumen, but for his literary excellence, both. Every intellectual's big brother, George Orwell's literary city. I welcome any questions or comments from the audience. Uh, Professor Ron, I do have a question. Um, the previous book, which you published about George Orwell, Scenes from an Afterlife, The Legacy of George Orwell, published in 2003, ends with a question. The epilogue is entitled, R. Orwell, Right? All that? Question mark. Part one of Every Intellectual's Big Brother, George Orwell's Literary Siblings, is entitled Dear Orwell, Left and Right. I think it indicates the continuity in your thought, in your understanding of the place of Orwell in modern culture. One thing I do notice is that after all these many years, Orwell now, at least in publishing, in scholarship, in literary studies, is achieving a canonical, a serious canonical position, which he did not have before. Because this book, as well as your next book, The Unexamined Orwell, are published with Texas in a series called Literary Modernism. How have you experienced that changing of the context? Because when you were growing up, when you were beginning to dedicate yourself to Orwell as a student, undergraduate student and later graduate student, um, the academy was resistant to considering Orwell a legitimate subject for MA work and PhD work. And yet, there you are now, 20, 30 years later, publishing books on this author in a solidly established uh, scholarly series, which welcome work on Eliot, on Pound, on Auden, on all the other writers who at one point were considered so much superior to Orwell. I find it very gratifying that Orwell would be acknowledged for his achievement. 
it seems to me highly suitable and very valuable that Orwell would receive increasing attention. Because Orwell was not simply a literary figure. He has demonstrated that he is a political writer <laughs> of immense significance, perhaps the greatest essayist in the English language since Hazlitt, the most important political writer of the 20th century in any language, and also a moral presence. Someone whose life, not just his written work, has been enormously attracted to readers. In literary terms, cultural and political terms, moral and ethical terms, Orwell is a writer who warrants our acquaintance as he had put it for Dickens, a, a writer well worth stealing. I would say at least a writer well worth reading. Back when I first became interested in Orwell in the 1970s, it was all very different, especially within the academy, as I mentioned. Even today, it's true that Orwell is often neglected when it comes to upper division English literature courses in the 20th century novel, let alone graduate courses. But this has partly been balanced out and eclipsed by the fact that for the first time, movements have arisen that in literary theory actually increase interest in Orwell rather than dismiss him. I mentioned how Explicación de Text or the New Criticism was rather uninterested in Orwell because his work seemed to be so much on the surface, not requiring literary exegesis and therefore not a matter that would be really availing itself of virtuoso exegetical study. The kind of rabbinical dedication that the new criticism, or for that matter, post-structuralism invited. But as post-structuralism and post-modernism have given rise to movements such as post-colonial studies, books and works of Orwell, such as Burmese Days, A Hanging, Shooting an Elephant, have gained new angles of attention from literary academics. Orwell, the master of the simple, plain style, is now appreciated for the rich context in which he is writing about imperialism and colonialism, even if he is sometimes derided by post-colonial critics as a defender of colonialism and imperialism. As a kind of successor to Kipling, one of his great admirations. So, it's been gratifying to me to see that Orwell is now firmly established in the canyon, even if perhaps not at the highest echelons. Now having been firmly established there, there is little likelihood that he will be dislodged. Publishers, literary academics, and even to this day, leading publications 
in the arts and in intellectual life, along with some of the most prominent intellectuals on the scene, admire Orwell for his achievement. That seems very unlikely to decline or disappear. So in that respect, also, I'm very gratified that this has taken place. Because Orwell deserves to be somebody that is read and studied. There is what F.R. Lepus referred to as the great tradition. And then there is what I myself have referred to in the politics of their reputation as the other great tradition. The great tradition of the realist and naturalist novel, indeed even the satire, traceable all the way back to Swift. Orwell stands in that tradition as a very proud successor and he too is a great tradition that is worthy of study. It includes many of his boyhood loves. William Somerset Long or the Edwardian as well as Bennett Galsworthy and on and on. And his successors such as John Wayne Kingsley Amos angry young men or movement writers in the 50s owe much to him. So the other great tradition in British literature, in the realist tradition, is one worthy of respect. And the elevation of Orwell is an acknowledgment that it is another great tradition worthy of attention. In this book also, for the first time, uh, you reflect on a concept which will come back in your work in later years, the concept of unlessons. In previous work on Orwell, you had spoken about lessons. I would like to ask about the, the genesis of this way of thinking, this new way of thinking about Orwell, the unlessons rather than the lessons. How, how did that arise? I should mention, too, in reply to uh, uh, the previous question, that Orwell's famous essay, My Country Right or Left, serves as the germ for those titles in both Scenes from an Afterlife, Our Orwell Right or Left, and in Every Intellectual's Big Brother, it is their Orwell, right and left. It is, again, is my attempt to show Orwell's appeal across the political spectrum. As far as uh, unlessons for my intellectual big brother is concerned, uh, that, of course, is my own way of adapting the language of newspeak to Orwell's reputation. Before one learns, there is usually a great deal to unlearn. And before lessons are inculcated and internalized, there is a necessity for unlessons. And these unlessons, so to speak, are very much what I have profited from in my own exposure to Orwell. So, unlearning, unlessons, an attempt to adopt the language of newspeak for very constructive pedagogical purposes. Is it also tongue in cheek to some extent? A reflection of all of the discourse of political re-education. Very much so, yes. Yeah, right. uh, one of the things I discussed in China in, and so forth. One of the things I discussed in, in one of my books devoted to East German socialism and its form of Ostspeak, <laughs> Eastern Newspeak, is 
the role of political re-education in the Nazi and then in the post-war communist era. It is Umerziehung, re-education. It was sometimes referred to as Umlearning or unlearning. Umlearning, the transformation in learning, but re-education is sometimes what is spoken of as having been conducted in Room 101. Umerziehung, re-education, umlernen, or unlearning, as a form of brainwashing, a lobotomizing of the mind, so that having been diehard Nazis, one now becomes a true believer Stalinist, simply moving from the far right to the far left of the ideological spectrum, but still in room 101. So yes, this is meant to be both an amusing derivation of newspeak and something seriously applied in political history. In all these ways, the inventiveness of Orwell's political imagination in 1984 plays a role. It is, he offers us a vocabulary, a vision, in which we can reimagine much of what is happening in history in his own time and understand our present and anticipate our future.